Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 23rd meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items 3, 4, 5 and 6 in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. The second item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence on the Scottish Parliament's environmental performance. We are joined by Sir Paul Grice, the Chief Executive, and Victoria Barbie, the Environmental Manager. Um, as you would expect, members have a series of questions for you. Uh, I'll kick those off. Um, Sir Paul, the Scottish Parliament has failed to meet its own reduction targets in areas of carbon footprint electricity use and waste generation for 2016-17. Why is that? Um, thanks. First of all, convener, thank you for the opportunity to come and give evidence for you today. And uh, we appreciate the support and encouragement and challenge of the committee uh, in, in, in hitting aim to hit our targets. You're right. Our electricity, um, in a sense, was a, a, a deliberate decision we took to look at energy mix. We uh, have uh, far exceeded our target in terms of gas. Um, reduction is down, you know, well, I think by about 24% against a target of 15. Um, but we found what well, the price of that was that a lot of people were using electric heaters um, in the in the uh, in the in the um, across the campus. So what we've looked at is to try to uh, adopt a more sophisticated approach to. Um, our building management system, uh, and although Victoria is much more expert, she could give you more detail, but broadly by trying to keep the uh, campus at a more even temperature, um, so it's little and often in terms of heating, meaning that we don't have to invest a lot of energy in heating spaces up from coal. So we're, we're optimistic, um, and I would certainly uh, hope it would before you next year that we're able to report a significant improvement in reducing electricity consumption. So that's one area we're, we're looking at. Um, it, waste, I think, continues to be a challenge for us. We do very well in terms of recycling and sending things off to uh, composting. Um, the figures there are very encouraging. What we are struggling to do is to uh, reduce the amount of waste itself. And there are a number of initiatives. There was an initiative you yourself um, encouraged us about engaging with members to try to um, in, uh, encourage a reduction in just the amount of paper which sent into us. And that's had a, a degree of success, though that's maybe something we could return to with some help uh, with the committee to encourage more members to do that. Uh, we're also, for example, working with a, a couple of suppliers. We've we found the two which bring in the most cardboard in, in packaging terms, and then essentially we recycle it for them free. So we're looking further up the supply chain to see whether we can work with those particular suppliers to reduce the amount of packaging. And, uh, and of course, there's the famous um, uh, cardboard cups for coffee, uh, which is also something we're, we're looking at. So we have a number of uh, issues. I, I'm optimistic on electricity. I, I, I'd be very disappointed if next year I'm not able to report to you a significant improvement. Uh, we've got some ideas on waste, but I think uh, realistically that will remain a challenge, reducing the quantum. Although, as I say, we do very well in the amount we actually recycle. OK. Um, <clears throat> perhaps I owe you something of an apology around my request to look at the amount of paper that was coming in, because I do seem to recall you were the subject of criticism from within the MSP cohort for some of the measures you took, but they were nevertheless welcome. Um, can I move on to business travel? Because the business travel performance is markedly worse. Is that because we have a problem, or are you simply capturing that better? Yeah, it's um, it, it's very much the latter, convener. This is this is new territory for us, uh, looking at the so-called Scope Three emissions. As you know, we we published a, a travel plan, uh, which is about travelling here and business travel, uh, and we wanted to capture an honest baseline. So I think what you see there is is a lot to do with the fact that we're recording it much better. Um, what I would hope to do as we go forward, having established a, a more credible baseline, is to report uh, to you, you know, improvements on that. So, for example, uh, we have an electric car now um, in the basement, which I know a number of members have used, and I've certainly used to replace, for example, taxi or other travel. Um, much more encouragement of uh, members and staff on uh, business trips to use the train, not the plane, um, and just an active 
travel to work plan, you know, whether it's cycling or walking or using bus. So on all of these, uh, I'm optimistic. So what you see there does look alarming, but in fact, it's, it's to do, as you say, with a measurement of the baseline. And again, hopefully going forward, we can then put ourselves in a position to give you, you know, a credible um, and, and candid assessment of how we're uh, performing against that. We don't measure the travel of witnesses, however, to parliamentary committees, do we? I look to your clerks uh, on that one. I, if, I suspect we don't. Uh, it's something we could do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to make it as comprehensive as we, as we can, and that's something I'd be very happy to look at. I know the clerks engage with committees well ahead, looking at their various other needs they might need here in the Parliament, for example, whether they have disabilities and others, and I think it would be a, a perfectly reasonable thing to encourage the clerks to engage with witnesses to uh, advise them on their, on their travel. Um, and then we could, uh, in doing that, we'd obviously be able to capture that information. So I'd be more than happy to take that forward with the committee office. And of course, we can also be encouraging witnesses to give evidence by alternative means that don't involve travel wherever that's possible. Well, it allows me, if I may, to commend the committee. Um, as you know, you would normally be meeting, I think, in committee room one. But as we speak, um, the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee is actually in that room, as we speak, taking evidence uh, by video conference from a witness. So again, that's something, um, and I think, I think Kate Forbes asked me last time about office-to-office um, uh, -office engagement. And again, we're by rolling out um, sort of uh, the, the sort of Skype product, to hopefully uh, we've enabled that. And certainly there's been a trend to committees taking more evidence by, by video link. So again, I think that's been a, a real innovation, something I hope that uh, we can do more of. So what, apart from that, what other measures is the Parliament looking at to ensure it gets back on track on some of these areas? It, it, it's a range thing. There is, there is no uh, one magic answer. We've invested, continuing to invest in technology. Um, most visibly, members will see that we replaced the chamber lighting over the summer, um, and that has a, a very considerable benefit. Um, at least, I think, a 50% reduction in electricity use, maybe better as we understand it. Certainly in terms of kilowatt hours, it's about 22 compared to 42 for the old system. But I think as we get, it's got much more f uh, flexibility in terms of use, different modes. Um, and I would hope that as we get more a better understanding, we can improve further on that. Um, so we continue, we've, we've put a lot of physical measures in, um, secondary glazing in Queensbury House. But I think behaviour is the key thing. I was really interested to uh, sit in on your previous session and the number of questions and witnesses talk about behavioural change. Um, and that's, I think that's just uh, a, a, almost a, an, ongoing, an ongoing job convenience, is encouraging all of us to think about how we travel, how we use, whether it's paper. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of this. It's just about <coughs> thinking about the cost of the resources we use. So I, I think it's a whole suite of things. And what's really encouraging is both members and staff. I've sensed a real change over the past few years. I think now the expectation among both MSPs and staff is that the environment matters and the there's not resistance, there's interest in ideas. Um, and I think that that change has definitely happened uh, in, in recent times. Um, and I think the challenge for us is to come up with imaginative um, and user-friendly ideas to, to keep pushing that behavioural change forward. OK, thank you for that. Let's move on and look at energy use. Uh, John Scott. Uh, thank you very much. And just to pick up at the end of um, Graham's last question, uh, Paul, um, committee lighting. Um, I notice uh, we're very, we're, I think, very happy with the new lighting in the chamber. I certainly am. Um, have you similar plans to um, address the energy use and committee lighting as um, a supplementary to Graham's question? Yeah, we, we don't have immediate plans to uh, adopt the same approach we have in the, uh, in, in the chamber. Partly that was driven actually by obsolescence um, and we've been sort of cannibalising the system for quite some time. To, and, and I think in it was a major investment, so I think for, for the time being. Um, but what we are looking at, and I'm not sure they already have, uh, we might look at the bulbs and other sort of more intermediate ways to deliver some savings. I, in time, I suspect we will move to um, a different lighting system, but we now have no, no current plans for that. Um, but also, I think it would be wise just to see how the uh, system in the chamber performs for a year or so, which would give us some good data and help us look at the business case for, uh, for committee lighting. Richard Lyle wants a brief supplementary. Yes, in regard to lighting, um, I know in certain parts of the, the building, if you walk into a room, the light comes on. 
Uh, is there any way that we're intended to move that to uh, committee meetings? All too often in the room next to me, people leave the light on and I continually switch it off. It annoys me intensely. Um, so, you know, are we looking at uh, committee rooms, uh, sorry, meeting rooms to have the, the lighting go, go off when no one's there? Um, you're right. I mean, in a number of places in the campus, we have motion sensors which uh, turn the lights on and off. Um, um, I'm happy to look with colleagues to see where there's other areas. Clearly, that's an investment and of itself has a, has a cost. Uh, as you say, uh, the cheapest way is for one of us, the last person to leave the room, just to hit the light switch. Um, so it, I, I think my preference would be just to continue to encourage people to turn the light off. But I'm more than happy to um, look with my FM colleagues to see there are other rooms in the in the campus where uh, motion sensors would would work. But most of us, I think, have got into the habit now of just turning the light off when we leave, and that's the cheapest way to achieve it. I understand that we we need uh, one more question, if you don't mind, convener. I understand that we need uh, lighting for the cameras to see where we are. But um, I've got two lights right in my eyes, uh, and there are like two, four, six, seven lights over there that I think are totally useless uh, that um, could be could be turned off. That would save a wee bit of interest. I, I, I've, I've, over the years, uh, my broadcasting colleagues will know that uh, uh, um, I often engage with them on the level of lighting in the chamber. But over the years, I've come to respect their professional expertise in ensuring that we have adequate lighting. I mean, the serious point is that um, a great number of people actually uh, um, engage with the parliament through... YouTube, through social media, um, and the quality of the broadcast is actually really important. Um, and uh, what we have to strike a compromise between this as a as kind of working meeting and actually, in a sense, a studio, because we need a good quality. And, and, I've, and they will, I think, back me up on this. I often ask them about lighting levels, but I, I've learned to understand that I think they have the minimum necessary to ensure that this is well-lit, good production because as I say thousands and thousands of people actually these days as you've just witnessed with your uh, session around minutes ago with social media uh, I guess that was going out live on Facebook was it um, so it's really important so um, please always feel free to ask the colleagues about whether any particular light needs to be on you but I, I think uh, the serious point is it they're, they're not redundant they're all part of getting the light levels right Thank you. Nonetheless, uh, I do think uh, <coughs> you raise an interesting point about broadcast because we are in this room. As you, if you look behind you, we're, we're keeping out the daylight, which would be pouring in, and then relighting this room um, to accommodate broadcast. And I, in terms of energy efficiency, I don't think that that can be efficient. And we do exactly the same in the debating chamber, and have done for many years now: keep the daylight out and then relight the chamber, which is not energy efficient, in my view. Uh, you and I know from your time as Deputy Presiding Officer, we're very much on the same side in terms of my, uh, my sort of battle to keep the blinds up as long as possible. And I assure you, I've continued that uh, into the current session, Mr. Scott. But um, the truth is that, you know, the, the, the great majority of people who witness the proceedings of this institution do so via broadcast. Uh, and, and that, even with the chamber... Uh, full uh, and it is really important to get a good quote. People expect these days um, on Facebook or, or whether it's the news uh, organisations using clips, and they do expect a high quality product. So, I'm with you on that, as, as you know. Um, but I think we have to respect our colleagues in broadcasting who are trying to get the best quality product. And there's a trade-off. You're absolutely right. Uh, between uh, it's it's better lit than if we were not broadcasting it. There's no question. But broadcast in its various forms, is the way we reach the greatest number of citizens. And I think that's most of us, I think, would feel that was a, an important objective. OK, um, we'll go on to our draft climate change plan, which suggests that emissions from public sector buildings will need to be near zero by 2032 with low carbon heat, meeting 64% of building heat demand by 2020 and 65% by 2025. So is the Scottish Parliament confident that in line with the draft climate change plan, emissions from this building can be near zero by 2023. And how would you hope? 20, I beg your pardon, 2032. Thank you, Graham. Um, um, yes, I am, um, for, for a number of reasons. First is the uh, fantastic support we've had from the parliamentary corporate body and indeed this committee. So, you know, above all else, what I feel I have as chief executive is very strong encouragement uh, uh, and support for the necessary investment and the behavioural change. That's why I'm, I'm optimistic. Having said that, I think we have 
um, I mean, it's an overused phrase, low-hanging fruit, but you know, we've, we've done a lot of the more obvious things. And Mr Scott, and I think we have to now consider, I think, perhaps some quite substantial investments around energy production and other things if we're going to hit those targets. Um, that's a, a, a dialogue. Um, uh, obviously, uh, have a colleague here from the corporate body who could who speak on that. But we've we've uh, we had a very good session with a corporate body just a couple of weeks ago, looking at this very issue, um, particularly around energy, where I think there's more we could do uh, with uh, with thoughtful investment, uh, in whether it's energy production or whatever. So, and and I said points I made before. I think we have. I think we've seem to have crossed a threshold in terms of behaviour, you know. Nowadays, no one, to me at least, says why we're doing this. They're interested in what we do. Not everyone agrees on the actions we need to take behaviourally, but we've crossed the point where people are asking whether it's necessary. And I think that will only gain momentum, and I took a lot of encouragement from the session you had earlier. Um, so I think we will continue to change our behaviour, we'll travel differently, uh, we'll continue to invest in technologies. Uh, and I think it's important that this institution leads the way, you know. Um, we can't reasonably expect other people to change the way they operate if we can't um, if we can't say that we're doing the same so I'm both optimistic but I think it's it's a, nece a necessity I think we have to show the way and we have to aim to hit those targets um, thank you and would you like to be more specific we wouldn't obviously bind you to anything but uh, what sort of things might you envisage yeah. S solar panels or heat source pumps or, or I think that I sort of thing yeah, on, on, on the basis of some excellent advice uh, from uh, Victoria, um, I, I think we feel the most uh, promising um, in terms of payback would be photovoltaic cells. As you know, we do have some solar panels on, on Queensbury House, but they're not they're the, the ones that actually warm the water up. And actually, because our, we were successful in having low water usage, actually it turned out to be probably not the right technology. So we're looking, and the corporate bodies asked us to come back with a business case for photovoltaic so, so that would be my, uh, I think that's the most likely. I think for the medium term, um, I actually think these sort of common local heating systems offer a lot of possibilities, um, really quite exciting possibilities. I think the lead from that is more likely to be with a local authority. Um, but we would be, and, and again, the corporate body encouraged us to engage in dialogue with the city council and other, if you look at this area of the city, there's a number of major major users uh, and I think and there's some I know of some very exciting projects el elsewhere in the country and in other countries uh, now this is more medium term but I think that's something we, we can look at where um, you can actually look at patterns of energy use spread across a number of users so they, they have two two specific ideas we've agreed that we'd, we we looked at heat source you know got a ground source heating um, on that we feel the technology is not sufficiently mature at this point, but the corporate body agreed we should come back in a few years' time to see how they could technology. So we're looking at all of these things, and it partly depends on how fast the technology moves, but I think the thing you might expect to see first would be installation of photovoltaic panels somewhere on the campus, um, provided we can persuade the corporate body that it represents good value for money. Thank you. Uh, David Stewart's got something on me. Can I just ask that if you do effectively replace the solar panels, what will you do with them? Good question, convener. Um, I think in line with our policy, the first thing to think, could, could we find a reuse or recycling? Um, the, the re, they're actually, the, the technology is perfectly good, but it works best with very high use, high water use. Uh, and it turns out that actually we, we don't use much hot water, which is a good thing. Um, so for example, you know, there are establishments not too far away from here, hotels and others that might have um, high water use. So I, I would hope the first thing we do is to see whether we can find another use for them. I would be very disappointed if they have to be sent off for, for recycling. But that's, that's what we would, uh, if, we, if we do end up replacing those current ones, we would, uh, we would certainly look to see whether we could find a productive use for them um, as a first, first course of action. Okay. Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you. John Scott stolen some of my thunder on solar panels, but just a very brief point. Um, clearly, the technology has changed dramatically, Sir Paul. That is, there are much more efficient solar panels than there were in the past. The other issue, of course, is that feed-in tariffs are still available from the UK government on that. Um, it, and also, I think companies like Tesla are producing solar panel tiles, which are state-of-the-art. State of Would you consider uh, utilising perhaps the top of the MSP block, because I'm conscious you would still require planning permission. There might be some visual issues around implementation of solar panels. Can you say just a little bit more yeah. about that? 
Um, yes, th thank you for that. You're right, technology is moving all the time. There's always a judgment with these areas with fast-moving technology. At what point do you stop the roundabout and, and, and buy it? Um, and uh, you, you'll know from the good discussion I think we had at the corporate body that we feel um, in terms of photovoltaic panels that actually it now would be a good time to make that investment if we're going to make it. Um, the planning is an issue, uh, and we, I think we, we also uh, begin, we'll begin informal engagement with the City of Edinburgh Council. I, I would very, mu very much hope that they would be accommodating, especially about putting them on roofscapes. Clearly, we have a, uh, panels on Queensbury House roof, um, and I would very much hope we could persuade them. And we would aim to work with them over design and exact location. Um, and I would be uh, hopeful that the local authority would be very supportive of giving us planning permission um, to install, you know, reasonably substantial quantity of photovoltaic panels. And, and as a result, obviously, back to your point, convener, I think that would really help us uh, in the medium term hit our targets on energy consumption. OK, thanks. Uh, Mark Roskell. Yeah, thanks. Um, Obviously, the footprint of the Parliament is more than just the Holyrood campus. Um, I mean, there must be at least 120, 125 constituency offices, depending on whether Lothian's members have offices or not. Um, so how, do the, how does the energy usage and the travel issues around constituency offices get factored into your plans? So particularly around energy, transport, we don't sure those that. size of things. Um, it's a good question. We don't measure that at present. You're right. There's around about 100, I think, uh, just over 100, 100 offices, and it's a very, it's a very good point. It's something again. I'd be happy to look at. Um, clearly, we would need the active cooperation of members. Um, I'm always conscious of striking a balance between respecting, uh, you know, members uh, should be free to run their local offices in the way that they think best. They know what their constituents need, and so I'm. And it, on the other hand, if there are areas where we can help members, guide them in terms of uh, good practice, um, certainly the travel plan w would cover that. So it's something I'd be more than happy to look into, maybe come back to the committee and, and indeed take the committee's guidance and advice uh, as to what uh, members... I'd like to work with members on that. I don't think it's about imposing um, from here, I, but I think there are, I, you, you make a very fair point. I mean, you know, we have a lot of small offices um, all of which have a have a footprint, um, uh, and I think it's an area that I'm interested in. But I would very much want to work with with members of Parliament and like, take their ideas um, on board. And again, it could be something that I'd be more than happy to come back to the committee on. Yeah, I would I would certainly find that useful. I mean, we've had security <clears throat> advice, um, and obviously there's budget there available for security improvements um, for individual constituency offices. But you know, we've had no advice on energy efficiency or. Indeed, just making a, a more pleasant working environment for staff, thinking about my office, which is a wee bit drafty and, and quite an old office that's been privately rented as well. Um, so that might be useful. And also extending travel planning. So, you know, travel planning is about coming to Parliament as well as coming to constituency offices as well as business travel. So if there are tools that are available, uh, that would certainly yeah. be useful. And ultimately, that's about improving the experience of people working for the Parliament, working for MSPs as well. I'm happy to do that. Victoria tells me we do offer members advice actually uh, okay. on that, but clearly uh, we haven't successfully <laughs> disseminated it. No. So, um, but I, look, I think it's a really good point. Uh, I'm more than happy to take a fresh look at that. Uh, look at what we currently do. Uh, could we communicate that better? Because clearly we haven't mm. entirely succeeded. But also to take up your wider challenge. Um, um, but I very much would like to use both this committee and the corporate body just to make sure that we've struck that balance right. We're going to get a lot further with this if members feel this is welcome and helpful advice and not me trying to impose something um, from Holyrood. So more than happy to have a look at it and perhaps right back to through you, convener, um, and, and pick it up from there. Thank you. John Scott's one final small point on this uh, topic. Very briefly, um, just as someone who leaves the building quite often between 9 and 10 o'clock at night, I know I walk along the corridor that I habit and close the windows um, every time I do so at that time of night um, because the energy loss through those open windows must be significant and I presume that's replicated across other floors other than the one that I'm on. Could we encourage members to close windows when they leave uh, for the day. It's just there's a lot of energy loss. And indeed to switch lights off in their offices. 
I think, uh, given that both you and Mr. Lyle have raised uh, the issue, I'll, I'll think about uh, uh, the best way to try and encourage. And, and I'm sure it's not just, by the way, members' block. I'm sure it exists across the campus. So it's back to behaviour change, and uh, you, you, you make fair points. And I think people are receptive. It's just reminding people in a way uh, that encourages them that, um, to do it. So I'll, I'll, I'll take this uh, meeting as a reminder to find a way to reissue guidance or find other ways to encourage people. OK, thank you for that. Let's look at transport. David Stewart. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> I can feed quite a few of the questions. Transport are ready to be covered, so I'll be, I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, we covered the issue, uh, it's all about video conferencing earlier. Um, I'm quite interested, if you look at comparisons from other organisations, such as University of Highlands and Islands in, in my patch, the norm f is for video conferencing. They do more VC than all universities in the UK put together. Um, so we, you talked earlier about a behaviour change. I've been in a number of committees in my time in the Parliament, and I always have a slight sense or a slight reluctance to use video conferencing because it's slightly out of the norm. Do you think we can change the mindset so that video conference video conferencing with our excellent facilities and committee room one and the mobile facilities are seen as the norm for witnesses, for example. Yeah, I think we could do more. I think the convener actually helped us with an event we did for Clarks earlier in the year to brief them. So that was the starting point so that all committees now have that. And I think we have seen an uptake um, in video conferencing and we'll, we'll continue that. Um, but against that, I'd make two points. I mean, one, um, and again, we, we, we've seen there is still something um, very powerful in evidence terms about face-to-face -face contact. Um, and my uh, understanding over many years uh, is that many, many witnesses want to come and see their members of parliament face-to-face. -face. Um, so I think we just need to recognise it's a human a human thing. And even the most sophisticated video technology, and I'm a, uh, an avid user of video uh, conferencing, it, you know, even the best technology, it's hard to replicate this. Um, it, it's just to do with how we communicate as, as people. And I think we need to respect that. And I'd always absolutely want to back any committee which felt that face-to-face -face was the way it did it, which of course might mean it travelling out to people, and sometimes that can also have have benefits um, in terms of getting witnesses. But I, but I agree with your fundamental point, and I think we need to, as officials, to continue to develop and maintain the technology. I think we've got past the point where we all were worried that it would break. It, you know, it, it's pretty reliable these days. There's a lot more of it. I think we could do we could do more and should. But I say, just slightly cautious about. Um, saying it's the default position, uh, partly because I think both members and witnesses, if they can, would prefer face-to-face, -to -face, and I think we should respect that. OK, thank you, Kavir. Thank you for that. Let's move on to procurement. Uh, Thinley Carson. Uh, good morning. Uh, this time last year, Victoria, you stated um, that you'd started to measure environmental impact uh, that the supply chain was bringing in. It was, it was touched on a little bit earlier. Can you... Uh, let us know what pro progress the Parliament has made with regards to the, the circular economy uh, and your approach to purchasing decisions. And maybe give us some examples over the last 12 months. Uh, and so, Paul, you also mentioned Scope 3 emissions. Uh, has the Parliament made any progress in being able to measure Scope 3 emissions associated with procurement? Go first. Yeah, so um, I, I guess a good example of a, an area where we've made more progress than, than other areas is around our furniture procurement. So uh, previously we would purchase furniture and then dispose of it once it was at the end of its life or, or offices were being reconfigured. Um, the new contract with our furniture supplier um, involves an element of repair and reuse of that furniture. So instead of just the furniture being disposed of at the end of its life, it'll hopefully be repaired, refurbished, brought back into the parliament or sold on or given to other organisations that can make use of it. Um, it's taken quite a long time to get this, this contract uh, in place, but hopefully this will be the first of many similar contracts and similar processes through procurement where we can look at a more circular economy model. Yep. I'm afraid I need to look to you on the, on the measurement of scope through emissions through procurement, where we've got to on that. 
Yeah, again, it's um, it's quite a, a challenge because we have to wait until contracts are up for renewal before we can put into a specification that the contractor needs to provide us with the scope three emissions. So it's it's slow progress, but it is definitely something we're looking to build into contract specifications for the future so we can start collecting that data. And then once we've got the data, we can do do more with it and, and work, work through different options. Yeah. There's just, there's, there's just another one. It, it came to, to mind when we're talking about uh, active travel and whatever. Currently, the, the, the cycle to work scheme uh, only covers people. Uh, you, you can only buy your bike from Halfords, basically, which doesn't always suit rural communities. So I had to drive to Halfords to get the bike, and I had to take it back to get it serviced. Is that something you consider? when you look at suppliers and whatever, the, actual, the impact it would be on, on members, not actually working in Parliament, but in the constituencies. I think that, yeah. that's partly because I think we've piggybacked on the Scottish Government scheme, is that right? I think Halfords was built into that. Yeah, well, um, you'd be pleased to know the new scheme is not just Halfords, so it will be um, available Good. to a lot more organisations and particular uh, small and medium-sized enterprise bike companies good. as well, so that would be good. And come along to the travel fair on Friday in the car park. We've got lots of, lots of information about sustainable travel and bikes on My that. electric bike. There's electric a, bike, yeah. Sh I should say there's a, um, a discounted service available, I think £15 to get your bike serviced, so a little plug for anyone who fancies a, a really top team of mechanics are going to be in so anyone who can get their bike here on Friday can take advantage of that. For that. Um, we had a debate, Sir Paul, in the Parliament last week on uh, Scotland's food and drink sector and our ambitions to grow that in which uh, members, myself included, extolled the virtues of Scottish produce. But I'm just wondering about the extent to which we as an institution promote and utilise Scottish products in Parliament with the, the obvious food mile and carbon uh, climate change impacts that has. And I mean, one example that comes to mind, we appear to source the tea in the Parliament from London when we in fact have a number of tea suppliers closer at hand. Um, yes, that's a fair point. Uh, I've looked specifically into Brodie's, who would be an obvious example of that. The problem is that they couldn't guarantee it was fair trade tea. And, of course, fair trade is one of our underpinning principles. So if the likes of Brodie's could guarantee that they sourced the tea from <coughs> fair trade, then obviously I'd be delighted for us to look at stocking it. So it's a, it's a good idea. And, I, and more, more generally, I would assure you that this is something we're really seized on, you know, we would, as far as possible, uh, we like to use uh, Scottish and local produce uh, for, lo for lots of reasons. I mean, for environmental reasons, but also it's absolutely consistent with the sort of economic uh, and other factors. Um, but that was a, it was interesting to look into it at your, your request, for which I'm grateful. Um, and um, so it just shows some of the things to balance off, but that's specifically on that. But there are other products, uh, of all sorts, you know, Scotland's famous for lots of, you know, beer and other sort of production, and we aim to do that. I'm always open to ideas, genuinely. Members have fantastic intelligence from their constituencies that we don't always have. And I would really genuinely encourage any member who feels there's a, a producer or a product or something interesting in their constituency, um, a local producer doing something really interesting, please get in touch. We can't always achieve it. Uh, but we'll always look at it seriously. And many of the uh, great products and ideas you see in the Parliament actually originated with members saying, do you know there's a producer in my area? Or as you've done, challenge us on issues. Because even if they, we can't solve it now, uh, we won't lose that sight of that idea. So uh, please encourage members, you know, even if we can't, we like these ideas. We do, you have much better knowledge about what's happening locally in Scotland. Um, and we will always look seriously at any proposition for a member, whether it's for a, a permanent product or whether sometimes we can just showcase things for a period of time um, as, as a way to, you know, give that producer some publicity and some interest. So I, I would encourage that. But I did look at tea specifically and I was interested to discover that. And it may be that's something that the supplier will address or is able to address, in which case we would obviously be delighted to look at a sort of famous Scottish brand um, here in the Parliament. Okay. Uh, Finlay Carson, then John Scott. Uh, in the earlier session, we heard uh, about uh, disposable cups, and, and there might be some uh, desire to bring in a, a cup charge or whatever. How successful has been the, the campaign 
in the Parliament to reduce the use of paper cups. Yeah. And, and if, and if your opinion it hasn't gone far enough, would you consider a, a more stick approach to, to stop members using or, 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 or members of staff using yeah. paper cups? I've never used a stick with members, and I, 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 I hope never. It's not, it doesn't usually it doesn't usually work out well for me. Uh, so uh, um, the uh, paper cup usage has gone down, I think, from ninety three to seventy six thousand uh, year on year. So that's about an eighteen percent reduction, which is really encouraging. But clearly, that's still an awful lot of disposable cups. Um, I think the the best way to do is just to continue. Uh, it's more common now, uh, and I've, I've changed it myself. You know, I found a decent reusable cup. Uh, everyone's got their own uh, preferences. I think, you know, again, we can all exemplify that, members and, and staff, particularly uh, more senior colleagues such as myself. I think we have a responsibility to show that. So I still think behaviour change. Um, the uh, the um, voluntary fine um, has raised, I'm told, about £150, which we gave to Holyrood Primary School to help them uh, purchase bee-friendly plants. So that's at a definite uh, benefit. Um, I wouldn't like to make that any more formal. I, I st my strong sense this is that, you know, we, we've got... Um, we've got momentum on this, and I think we'll achieve more by just continuing to encourage. I don't want it to seem onerous. I think it's it's far more likely you'll persuade people. But 76,000 cups, even although I should say they are compostable, uh, which is a positive thing. But, but I, you know, I would really hope that when I'm before you next year, if we continue that uh, level of reduction, we can really get that down. Because uh, as I think as was said in your earlier session, really there's there's almost no need to have. Um, a, a throwaway cup in this in this place. You know, we, we ought to be able to get that down to a very very uh, low amount. So good progress, but more to do. But I think I'd con prefer to continue to try to persuade people rather than wave a stick at them. Sorry. Of course, Victoria hand, would take a different approach. Your hand may be forced, of course, further down the line by government action on that. Well, th that would be different. I mean, if that's the phase, if that's the decision across the country, then obviously we would respect that. Um, but, but you know, I think you can see that we're making, from a high start, we're making good progress. I say that's I think an eighteen percent year-on-year reduction. If that continues, then two, three years from now, I think we, we can really look back with some some pride that we've actually changed the behaviour. Okay. Thank you, Mark Roscoe. Um, yeah, just to go back to the food supply chain issue again and shortening, you know, food miles and encouraging more local procurement. I mean, a lot of those objectives are wrapped up in the Food for Life program. So I think I'd asked the corporate body previously about what progress we we're making towards achieving the silver standard, which obviously ramps up the, the amount of local produce that's being sold. Um, so I just, just wondered if, if there's an update on that in terms of how close we are to achieving that standard now. I'll ask Victoria to update you on that. Yeah, um, we're, we're looking at perhaps a slightly different tact in the fact that we have the Carbon Trust triple standard for energy, water and waste. And the Carbon Trust are now, um, in conjunction with the Soil Association, releasing a new standard. I think it's called the Green Kitchen Standard. So we're working with them to um, try and align all of our certifications through the same body. So instead of going for the silver soil association standard, we'd go for the green kitchen standard, which incorporates a lot of that local and organic produce and also energy efficiency around um, the cooking of, of food and procurement of it through transport. Okay. So that's the tack that we're taking at the moment. <laughs> okay. I wonder if it would be helpful. Come in, picking up your point, others, whether um, we could come back to you with a, a more... De de I mean, clear the whole supply chain, especially around food as an area, you know, you and a number of colleagues have, have, have raised it, uh, including Mr. Ruskell just now. I mean, I'd be more than happy to write the committee in more detail, now, not just about where we are, but, you know, where we think we're going on this to give yeah. you a better sense. There's some quite technical issues in it, and whether we're into supply chain or into procurement, there's obviously some limitations to what we can do, and I'd be more than happy to give you a, a more detailed note, trying to wrap up some of the points that colleagues have raised. Okay, that, I think that would be useful. Uh, John Scott. <coughs> Very finally, I'm just, uh, could it be written into the contract with Sodexo that we would prefer, wherever possible, Scottish food and that Scottish food be showcased? And I have to declare an interest as a Scottish food producer, of course. But um, in terms of showcasing Scottish food, could, could that be part of Sodexo's contract? I think that is in the contract, but if I, as I've offered, uh, the conveners agreed I should write back to you. I will check that. I th there is something of that. I th like that, 
uh, clause in the contract, Mr. Scott, but I'm more than happy just to check that out. And when I write back to you, um, I'll give you a, a detailed answer on that. Thank you. Uh, could we extend that to look at drink as well? I mean, Scotland's got a yes, burgeoning course. reputation around craft gins and vodkas. Yeah. Is there anything that's thought was having a gin of the month, vodka of the month, yeah. whatever, in the bar? Well, I drink neither, so I don't have to declare no, an interest. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, uh, no, it's, it's a, it's, no, it's a good point. It's, it's a very important uh, part of the Scottish economy. We know that. Uh, the bar certainly does stuck stocks, Scottish beers and Scottish gins. But uh, I think you're right, we could, we could probably do more uh, t you know, to promote it. I think it's a, it's a good idea and I'm happy to come back on that point as okay, well. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to another subject. Claudia Beamish on the pension fund investment. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning to you both. Um, could, could I ask you, Sir Paul, last year um, in relation to um, pensions, you stated um, that the trustees have, and I quote, a strong legal duty with pensions, which of course some I recognise and um, we all respect. Um, transparency is always um, of great value um, in any sort of relation to finance and money, of course. Um, and I'm, I'm, for me, personally, this is sort of an, an ethical issue, and I know it is for many other people um, uh, in this parliament and in, in the public sector widely, and, and people do look to us um, as, as leaders, I believe, I hope. <laughs> um, and some of the opportunities in uh, low carbon um, investments are no longer regarded by some as um, high risk in spite of more traditional views. Um, there are models of change in the public sector, which um, you may well have um, uh, had dialogue um, with the corporate body about investigating over the past year, but it would be most helpful um, if you could let us know, has there been further consideration given to the issue of pension divestment from high carbon stocks in the past year and possibly investment in more local um, uh, carbon, low carbon issues like you've highlighted in relation to the parliament and local authorities? Yeah, I recognise this is a, 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 an issue of, uh, of, of concern to many members. Um, specifically after the last meeting, I wrote to the chair of the pension fund trustees, uh, uh, passing on to him your concerns. Um, it's difficult for me to say any more for the simple fact that actually it's not the corporate body's responsibility. Um, they are not the fund trustees. Uh, and Mr. Stewart's more expert than me on this, having been a, um, a trustee. So the, the, uh, the, the corporate body, you know, since who I represent, are de facto the employer. You are, there are no employers. Clearly, members of parliament are, are office holders. They're not, they're not employed, but for pension purposes, uh, we effectively act as employer and make the contribution. In a sense, that is our only interest in it, in a legal sense. It's entirely a matter for the pension fund trustees. Um, I, I certainly, as I undertook, wrote to the chair of trustees passing on your concerns. The dialogue you talk about, I, I absolutely agree, is an important dialogue to have. And I'm not in a habit of coming and saying it's not an issue for me, but in fact, it, it literally is not an issue for myself or the corporate body. That's a dialogue to have with the pension fund trustees. I, I do know, obviously, because I take an interest as the representative of the employer in that, so I'm, and, the, and the current setup, as you know, um, as I think you know, certainly I briefed you last time, is that the, um, we're part of a managed fund, a Bailey Gifford managed fund. It's relatively small. Um, and therefore, at the moment, the judgment, I believe, of the trustees, and that would certainly be my understanding, is it's not yet feasible to have an independent pension fund. When you're part of a managed fund, obviously, although you can choose which fund to go with, obviously, you won't accept the investment decisions made on that. So I absolutely recognise this as a, as a key issue, and at a personal level, I really understand this. But the dialogue... I think has to be with the pension fund trustees, the corporate body. Its duty um, is to, you know, represent your best interest as the proxy for your employer in terms of making adequate contributions to ensure the pension fund remains viable. Beyond that, the real, the very real issue, which I recognise, of what it invests in, is a matter um, for the fund trustees, uh, and, and I'm certain um, that they would be willing to engage in a dialogue. With you, because you rightly say, you know, openness is a, is a key. Whatever decisions are made, um, and and knowing, uh, I think all of the trustees, I, I I can't imagine any of them would not be willing to engage in a dialogue and explain to you even how they perhaps see 
uh, this developing uh, over future years. As the fund continues to grow, it may reach a point where actually it's uh, feasible to have an independent fund, um, in which case, of course, you have more latitude as to what you invest in. Right, thank you. And, I, and, and that's a um, helpful comment and for us to consider as a committee as to if and how we uh, decide to take that forward. Thank you very much, Paul. OK, thank you for that. Um, Richard Lyle. Yes. Good morning. Firstly, can I say that since coming to this place, I've been thoroughly delighted with the way that I've been treated by staff and the way that staff carry on their duties, and in particular yourself and your office. Uh, so I think that has to be put in the record. Can I move on? Um, during the week, there was a comment in regard to Westminster re renovation, um, but there was also a comment regarding the adaptation and the resilience of this building. Uh, would it last 40 years? Would it last 100 years? Or how long would it last? Um, Victoria, in September, you uh, referred to five steps to managing your climate risk, a guide to public bodies in Scotland. Can you remind me what your five steps were? And what progress has Parliament made in developing an adaptation plan and increasing its resilience to the impacts of climate change? And will this building only last 40 years or 100 years? Or, you know, we 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 may not be around then, but uh, as an, an individual. But how long uh, will this building? It's a, as far as I'm concerned, it's a it's a lovely building. It's an iconic building. It's uh, certainly an, a, a futuristic building. Um, so how are you managing the building? OK, so the, the recommended five steps to climate change adaptation are <laughs> getting started, understand the impacts of climate change, identify and prioritise actions, take actions and monitor, review and evaluate. And we have undertaken the first two steps of those um, recommended steps from Adaptation Scotland. We held a workshop uh, with Adaptation Scotland uh, in 2016 um, and then followed that up with identifying and prioritising all of the actions we can take around adaptation. Um, and one of those uh, steps was to provide some guidance for local officers as well, actually, around what they can do on adaptation. And my colleague who's sitting in the back um, from SPICE is helping us to develop that uh, plans for local offices, which is really good. Um, you'll be pleased to know that this building is still relatively new and uh, doesn't need a lot to adapt to climate change. We're hopefully touch wood, the roof tiles are not going to blow off and we're not going to be flooded anytime soon, she says. <laughs> um, so we do have the, we are working through the adaptation plan as set out by Adaptation Scotland so that we can make sure that this building is here for, for many, many years to come. And I'm glad you raised the life expectancy point. Um, it's really important to draw a distinction between accounting practice, which was what was reported. There is a standard accounting practice over the period in which you essentially have to depreciate and, and look at lifespan. Um, our absolute expectation is this building, which was built with at least a 100-year lifespan, will last that and a way beyond that. The actual basic infrastructure should pretty much last in perpetuity. Of course, over many, many decades, one has to look at you know, windows and, and plant, but I can give you an absolute assurance that there's a huge distinction between what was reported, which is simply what was in our accounts, which were, were sort of bound by standard accounting practices, and our expectation that this building will last far, far longer than what was reported. So I hope that's a helpful reassurance to you. It is a, a hopeful reassurance. And, and the one thing that I've felt in the last number of years is the the quality that the, the staff uh, enjoy coming to work and the way that the, the staff uh, look after this building. You know, uh, the, you know, currently your, um, one of the questions I first asked when I came was regarding the wooden spars. I was reminded that these are louvres, not wooden spars. And they're being currently upgraded, painted, etc. So um, what is the current cost of looking after the building? And um, you know, what's the projected uh, cost over the years? Um, from the day we moved in, um, under guidance of our excellent um, head of facilities, um, we adopted a 25-year rolling maintenance plan. Uh, and his very strong advice to me and, and uh, um, colleagues who have been in the corporate body, Mr Scott and others will remember this, that we, we didn't 
make the mistake which i think some building owners have done of, of taking a holiday for a few years because the building was new we began investing in it almost from day one in terms of uh, maintaining the um especially the yeah, external wood i mean you know we, we live in a, a wonderful but pretty tough climate uh, and so we've continued to invest in that we continue to do that um and i think that that's paid dividends um if we if we genuinely want this place not just to be standing in 200 years time but but look fantastic we have a responsibility as the current guardians of the institution to invest in it, and i believe very strongly in that um, i'll need to write to you with the exact amount we spend on maintenance um, I was, uh, I'll be revising that for my appearance before the finance committee in a little bit of, bit of time, but I, I can easily, I can easily check that and, uh, and drop you a note via the clerks on that point. But just to reassure you that it's, uh, we've always had, I've had terrific support from, uh, successive corporate bodies to maintain a sensible level investment. And so we don't face that, you know, a, a huge problem in five or 10 years time. And, and I think, and hope, you know, well, after I've moved on that we continue that policy. Thank you very much. Do you want a, a brief supplementary, Mr. Lyle? No, no. That's, that's okay, fine. that's fine. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Um, Finlay Carson mentioned coffee cups earlier, and uh, the current UK Parliament's Environment Audit Committee, they have an inquiry into the use of disposable packages such as coffee cups and plastic bottles. Are you comparing our progress with other parliaments across Europe? or UK Parliament and other devolved assemblies. My point being, are we doing better? No, it's, it's, a, really good, uh, it's a really good question. It's, it's hard to do a formal benchmarking. Everyone seems to have different baselines and different uh, approaches. So it, it's hard to produce a sort of numeric comparison. For example, our colleagues in Wales, who we often benchmark with, have a, have a different baseline, I think 2008, eight nine, whereas ours is five, six. That said, yes, we do is the short answer. Wherever we see um, another parliament, uh, whether it's Wales, Germany, colleagues in the UK doing something interesting and better, uh, we're absolutely you know, happy to take on people's other, other ideas. Um, and at all levels, so Victoria um, is in contact with her colleagues. I know clerks of various committees is a good way to get intelligence. And I have um, you know, uh, regular and frequent um, dialogue with my uh, colleagues from from Northern Ireland and Wales and Westminster and and uh, uh, but I will next time in fact I'll be meeting two of the colleagues in a couple of weeks time and actually I'll happily specifically put this on the agenda just to make sure that we're not missing um, ideas it's also pleasing to note that other parliaments have adopted some of our ideas I believe the Australian Parliament cited this Parliament as inspiration for starting uh, beehives um, so, you know, it's nice, nice to think that we're getting some recognition. But you make a really important point. I mean, it's, it's a great way. If it works in another parliament, then my starting position is why wouldn't it work here? And uh, we're very open um, to other people's good ideas. But I'll, I'll take up that specific point when my two colleagues from Wales and Northern Ireland are here in a couple of weeks' time. I'll put that on the agenda and, and, and make sure that we're not missing any, uh, any ideas that they're pursuing. Okay, thanks. Okay, it was useful to explore that. Um, let's look uh, forward to future targets. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. And a number of these points will have been mentioned in, in the previous evidence. But um, what, as you look ahead, what are the big ticket investment items that the Parliament is likely to have to consider in order to achieve the future emission reduction targets? I, th I, th I think for me, the big one is around energy. I mean, I, I think both energy usage and energy, energy production, I think that, that for me is where, um, where uh, we're going to have, if we're going to, you know, really hit these demanding targets, which uh, I think it's hugely important we do. We, we can't credibly be um, in asking other people to hit them if we don't. So I think we have a, a role, not just as an institution in its own right, but a, as an exemplar. Um, and I think we have to be prepared and say, I've, I've had very strong encouragement for Mr. Stewart and his colleagues on the corporate body to do that. So I think that's what you should expect to see. And I think we, we just need to be prepared, I think, as an institution to, 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 to try some ideas out. So I think that's where you will see. Um, I think an area which isn't about a single big investment, but which I think will take a lot of behaviour and other change, is around the scope three stuff. Uh, I think uh, procurement isn't, isn't easy. It's complex. Uh, you, you're into contractual and legal issues. 
but I think we need to make, so I would regard that as a big ticket item of a different type. We need to continue to really work hard on this. The, the encouraging thing is to, to pick up point raised by the convener and others is that what we're trying to achieve is something people want. You know, they want local source, high quality product. So we're going with the grain that the challenge there is just it's you know, supply. I didn't realize myself until I looked into it, just how complex supply chains are. So we need, we need to get a better understanding to work on that. And then the other one I think is around travel. Uh, travel is a big contributor overall, and uh, because we didn't measure it previously, perhaps it was off the radar. Now we've begun to measure it, at least it's given us a sighter on that. And the challenge there is because that's hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals taking decisions and finding ways to persuade them. And again, it, it's something that maybe uh, the committee can lend its considerable uh, weight to. Uh, there you are really into behavioural change. We can make things easy. We've invested hugely in cycling and other facilities to make that easier. Um, electric car charging points, fine. We will make all of those investments. But at the end of the day, we've all of us, myself included, we've got to change behaviour. And I think that's a big ticket item in terms of behaviour. So they would be the three, I, I would say, if we can really crack all of those, then I'd be very optimistic that we can be at the leading edge of this, where I think, where I think we should be. Mm. Um, and just uh, lastly, in the in the climate change uh, bill proposals, the Scottish government is considering revising its target for 2020 to 56 percent compared to 1990 levels. Is the um, Scottish Parliament does the Scottish Parliament anticipate revising its targets for 2020? Um, I think if the government changed it, then we would want to we would want to do that. And we haven't had chance to give. It's obviously just recently been. Um, uh, announced. There's always got a little caveat in there. So other, I have colleagues elsewhere in the organisation with a sharp intake of breath. But no, we, we, I say, I, I, th I think the Parliament, I think you as members would, I think, want your institution to be one we can be proud of and stand and, and stand up with targets that we're setting for others. So um, my starting point, if, if, if they change the target, then my, my starting point is how can we change to achieve that? Um, I don't yet know enough to say to categorically we could and again certainly next time I give evidence before you I'd be more than happy to give you a, a firmer answer but certainly that would be my aspiration. Great and my last comment is that since being elected as well in terms of the technology available it's done wonderful things for being able to connect to the highlands and islands it's further we could go but whether it's mobile surface or whatever it's been really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Okay, can I, I think on that note, we should wrap this session up. Uh, can I thank you both for your time today? I think that's been incredibly useful. You've undertaken to write to us on a number of items. We would welcome that. But I think we would also look forward to continuing engagement with the Parliament on the issues we've uh, discussed today. It doesn't just have to be kind of wrapped up in an annual session. So if there are any developments along the lines that we've covered, it would be useful for the, the Parliament to continue to keep us uh, appraised of, of any progress or otherwise. They do that. And again, uh, yeah, really generally thank the committee for your challenge and your, your encouragement. Um, and uh, very happy to keep you uh, appraised uh, of progress. And of course, at, at any time, would obviously be happy to come back before the committee if that would be useful. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so at its next meeting on the 26th of September, the committee will take evidence from the Crown Estate Scotland. It will also initially consider petition PE 01636, which calls on all single-use drinks cups to be 100% biodegradable. As agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.